morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your pastor. And today, we're going to do a little light reading. <laughs> Some people got scared when I pulled that out. You'll find out what it's for later. So if you're not new here among us, you know that my family and I, we went overseas a couple weeks ago. Is it two, three, maybe a month ago or so? And we went for two weeks. But here was the thing. We, we had a challenge before we went. We decided we were going to go for two weeks, carry-ons only. Now think about that. If you've traveled a lot, you know, if you've traveled a whole lot, that makes a lot of sense, right? But you're like, wait a minute, because you get like, you know, a little piece of luggage and then a backpack. Now, there are a couple things behind this, practicality, economy, all that stuff comes into play, but it was really just a challenge for my wife. She likes Tetris, right? So she <laughs> can really, you know, if you challenge her, you're like, there's no way we can make it two weeks. She's like, oh, really? You want to see, right? So, so this is what happens because uh, we don't do any of that, my daughter and I. So you get an ask, right? So you get a pile of stuff and you're like, I want to take this. And of course, it's like way too much stuff, but it's like a challenge. We're really kind of egging her on, right, trying to see what happens. And if you know the dynamic in my family, it's kind of funny. But if you know anything about me, <laughs> you do. <laughs> it's a thing. I'll never learn. But anyway, if you know about me, I like to be clean. So when you say hygiene, it means two things to me. <laughs> you, can, you can use that. It's not the first time I've heard it, but I'll laugh just to be polite because I'm a pastor, right? That's what we do. So anyway, I, I, the idea of wearing the same clothes after sweating to me is repulsive. It just, that's it. I just got to be honest about it. It's just a clean thing. That's all it is. Don't read into it too much. So here's what happens. I need 14 pairs of pants, all right? So that's the first thing. So it's like this pile. And that's not even going to fit in one of the suitcases anyway. Then I need 14 shirts and 14 pairs of underwear. Socks, you know, I got the sandals. Shoes aren't a problem. I'm going to wear sneakers. And then I have sandals I'm going to wear. It's a summertime over there. And so, you know, it all gets kind of put out on the bed, right? And she's getting ready to pack it. <laughs> and so the first pile of the pants, she's like, you cannot take those with you, right? They're, they're not going to fit. You can't take them with you. I'm like, okay, I can wear pants twice, right? So fine, half the pile goes or so. And then the shirts, right? You can't take those with you. And I'm like, really? It's, I'm going to get sweaty. And then she reminds me they have things like running water and laundry services in Europe. So you, duh, you, know, <laughs> you can take them. You'll be fine. We have a bathtub. We can wash it in there. Remember when we did that when we were really poor? Oh, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> we're going to do all that stuff. All right. So half the shirts go. So then the next pile is the underwear. And I said, I'm taking all of them with me. That was it. <laughs> there was no way. But here's, here's the, funny, the really funny part is that so we get to the airport and uh, I think the kiosk wasn't working. Like, everything's electric. It's been 20 years since I've traveled overseas, and I didn't realize how different it was. Like, everything's electronic. Sometimes it's scary because there's no real people. And so you're like, oh, man, I hope I scan in okay. Otherwise, like, this is not going to work. But, you know, so we couldn't, like, scan the luggage. Right? We, we got on the first flight. We did. Right? And they didn't check the weight. And so we got away with it the first time. But then we couldn't, like, scan in for some reason. We had to talk to a real person who has a scale. And they're like, weigh the bag. And it brought me all the way back to like my martial arts and fight days, right? You know, you gotta do the weigh in. It didn't make weight. <laughs> I was like, what's wrong with you? You, know, you knew you had a fight coming up. So it didn't make weight, and so we had to check it anyway. So <laughs> that's what happened. Now, it's a good exercise, it's a really good exercise in making you like think about what you actually need. It was a really good exercise. You knew it was going to come to religion, right? So what you actually need. Like, what do I actually need to take with me? You know, so you're living out of a suitcase for a couple weeks, but it wasn't bad. And I didn't miss a lot of the stuff I think I needed. You know, so a really good exercise in that. What's important to you? And it made me think of this story of a man preparing for a funeral. So he's real old, and he knows, of course, he's going to die soon. So he wants to make it easy on his loved ones. And so he goes to a funeral home. Yeah, it's going to get depressing, right? So he always ruins everything. I thought we were going to have fun today. So <laughs> we'll talk about that, too, in a minute. So he goes to the funeral home, makes the arrangements, right? So he gets the burial plot. This is where you're going to be next to the tombstone or whatever you call it, the headstone, right? What are you going to say on it? Philanthropist, because I've been very generous my whole life. So he gets all that done. They get to the point where they're doing the paperwork. And they're doing the paperwork, and the old man says, well, we're not done yet, you know, the payment and all the other stuff. And he's like, 
okay, what, what else do we have to talk about? The hearse. And he's like, well, we have a hearse. It's, it's just fine. It's a nice hearse. It's fairly new and shiny. He's like, yeah, but what's the engine like? He's like, I think it's an eight-cylinder engine. I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah, right. well, how much torque does it have? He's like, uh, you're not going to be in a hurry, bro. Like, dude, relax, you know? <laughs> and so he's like, well, what's the hauling capacity? He's like, you're not very heavy, you know, so that's not going to... What hauling capacity? And so the old man points to, like, a trailer that he has hitched to the back of a truck that he brought in there. And he's like, you see that trailer? And he goes, yeah. That trailer has all my stuff in it and I'm taking it with me. <laughs> All right, not the best joke, but it's a timeless one. <laughs> anyway, so what's the theme today? Taking it with us. So going back over the last few weeks, right? So last week we asked, is the honeymoon over in, in our relationships and with Jesus? We had talked about money, right? So we talked about marriages. So why not talk about death? Why not just do that and just rip the Band-Aid off? That's what we're going to do. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. If you think... I like depressing topics. You're probably right. But, <laughs> but we're doing a series, right? Remind you guys. Think. We need to think about it. It's the Bible chronologically-ish. It can be hard to do. Scholars debate over the exact order of things, but not the point. chronologically -ish. So what we're doing is Jesus is picking the topics. That's just what's happening. I'm just reading the Bible straight through. And so... He's picking these topics. And it's an interesting thing to think about. This is just Jesus talking. He's still talking. He's still going week after week. So it has been said, and I think it's true, that the Bible doesn't read like most people preach. It sounds a little different, doesn't it, when you're just listening to Jesus all the time? So basically, I'm just taking all the responsibility off of myself. That's it. It's nice. Being an ambassador is the best job in the world, right? I don't know. I'm just delivering the message but then they shoot the messenger. So here's a chart. <laughs> here's a chart for you. So this is the chronological-ish order of what we're doing. All right, so this one, uh, there's a lot to it. It seems like a lot, but it actually flows very, very nicely. Jesus does things like that. Um, so if you're really interested in this uh, and you're a Bible nerd like me, uh, you can go into our app, and it's in there if you really want to check it out and study along and read along. It has the Bible study questions and everything in there, so you can kind of track along. Bible study always follows the message. It's where you can ask questions and engage in it. So <clears throat> let's hop right in. We left off at the story of the two sons. So just to kind of remind you what's going on here, right? Lip service, right? One's like, yeah, I'll go do it. And then he doesn't go do the chores. The other one's like, nah, I'm not going to do it. And he goes and does it. And so this represented the people who repented of their sins and, and ended up doing it. Not that it's a good idea to give Jesus lip service. So now we're just going to continue right along. Matthew 21, 33. Now listen to another story. A certain landowner planted a vineyard, built a wall around it, dug a pit for pressing out the grape juice, and built a lookout tower. Then he leased the vineyard to tenant farmers and moved to another country. At the time of the grape harvest, he sent his servants to collect his share of the crop. But the farmers grabbed his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. So the landowner sent a larger group of his servants to collect for him. But the results were the same. Finally, the owner sent his son, thinking, surely they will respect my son. But when the tenant farmers saw his son coming, they said to one another, here comes the heir to the estate. Come on, let's kill him and get the estate for ourselves. So they grabbed him, dragged him out of the vineyard, and murdered him. When the owner of the vineyard returns, Jesus asked, what do you think he'll do to those farmers? The religious leaders he's speaking to replied, he'll put the wicked man to a horrible death and lease the vineyard to others who will give him his share of the crop after each harvest. Then Jesus asked them, didn't you ever read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and it is wonderful to see. He's quoting the Psalms. I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation that will produce proper fruit. Anyone who stumbles over that stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone it falls on. So when the priests heard this, and the people he's talking to, they want to kill him, right? But they're afraid because they're considering Jesus a prophet. They don't want to get in trouble with the people. So what's the meaning here? Well, the meaning here is that... He's describing these people that are coming to these just tenant farmers. And remember that word, 
They're like the prophets. Finally, what? His son. That's Jesus. You're going to kill him too, right? And so then there's going to be a judgment to pay for that. But just remember, they're tenants, right? So they're trying to take ownership over this thing. And so those are the religious leaders, these people who aren't getting it. They say they're getting it. They're not getting it. And they kill all the prophets before Jesus. There's a theme building here. Next, we're going to kind of just go over this sort of quickly. There's the parable of the great feast. And next, Jesus just tells this parable. And it's like what we saw in Luke 14, but a similar thing. You have a king that holds a wedding feast for his son. But here, it's more about the rejection of that invitation, right? So he sends his servants out, go invite everybody. But everybody's like too busy for it. So what is this? This is the religious leaders rejecting him, right? So they reject him. So fine, they actually end up killing some of the messengers. Same type of theme here. So he goes, he takes care of all those people, sends the servants out again to everybody now, the good and bad. What does that resemble? Well, these people who weren't like the Jews or these chosen people or think that they're chosen, right? So out to everybody, the Gentiles, sinners, everybody. Tell them to come on in. Well, they do. They have a great feast, but there's someone who's not really wearing the right wedding clothes. And then he kicks them out into like outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, one of Jesus' favorite ways to describe hell. For many are called, but few are chosen. And so, well, you know, you might want to change your mind and get in later when you see that the party's pretty good, but no, you know, that's it. It's too late. There's going to come a time when it's too late. So that's what's going on here. So next, you're going to get a set, and it's really good if you really are into the Bible, you really like to be a Bible nerd, you should remember these as a set. There are people questioning Jesus here. So, you know, easy way to remember it. Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, like different groups of people questioning Jesus and presenting Jesus with questions. And it's all in a row. And one's more popular than the other two, perhaps. So I'll just tell them straight through. Matthew 22, 15. Then the Pharisees met together to plot how to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. They sent some of their disciples along with the supporters of Herod to meet with him. Teacher, they said, we know you, how honest you are. You teach the way of God truthfully. You are impartial and don't play favorites. Now tell us, <clears throat> what do you think about this? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus knew their evil motives. You hypocrites, he said. Why are you trying to trap me? Here, show me the coin used for the tax. When they handed him a Roman coin or a denarius, he asked, whose picture and title are stamped on it? Caesar's, they replied. Well, then he said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And give to God what belongs to God. His reply amazed them, and they went away. Pause. So it'll keep going, but there's a little bit going on. Some of it's obvious, you know, what's going on here, right? Why are you so concerned with money? Stop trying to train. He turns it on, but he turns it on them in a way, unless you know just a little bit about the history going on here and a little bit about the context. What does he do? Now, show me the coin. What's on it? Caesar. But that's not all. All right, so if you know a little bit about who they considered Caesar to be, it says on it, Caesar is God. That's what it says on that graven image. <laughs> so they have just broke the first two commands <laughs> of the Ten Commandments. And so he's calling them out in a big way. All right? So it's kind of cool. There's a lot of gravity under what Jesus is doing here. So Matthew 22, 23, that same day, Jesus was approached by some Sadducees, religious leaders, who say there's no resurrection from the dead. They pose this question. Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies without children, his brother should marry the widow and have a child who would carry on the brother's name. Well, suppose there were seven brothers. The oldest married one and then died without children. So his brother married the widow. The second brother also died, and the third brother married her. This continued with all seven of them. Last of all, the woman also died. So tell us. Whose wife will she be in the resurrection? For all seven were married to her. Jesus replied, your mistake is that you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they will be like the angels in heaven. He continues, but now, as to whether there will be a resurrection of the dead, haven't you ever read about this in the scriptures? Long after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died, God said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So he is the God of the living, not the dead. When the crowds heard him, they were astounded at his teaching. 
Continues, Matthew twenty-two thirty-four. 34. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with this reply, they met together to question him again. One of them, an expert in religious law or scribe, tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and the demands of the prophets are based on these two commands. Now, in Mark, it's a little bit more of a dialogue. The scribe kind of affirms it, repeats the whole thing, and Jesus says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But in Matthew, Jesus is going to put an end to the questions here. So he asks the Pharisees a question. What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? They replied, he's the son of David. That's what they keep calling him, if you notice. Then why does David, speaking under the inspiration of the Spirit, Mark, Holy Spirit, call the Messiah my Lord? For David said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies beneath your feet, Psalm 110.1. Since David called the Messiah my Lord, how can the Messiah be his son? No one could answer him, and after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. And you got to continue. Remember, he called hypocrites. So now Jesus goes on this hair on them, the bigger sections in Matthew, an absolute tear. I'll summarize it for you. Basically, he's telling the people, the crowds and the disciples, listen, practice whatever these religious teachers tell you to do, but don't follow their example because they're a bunch of hypocrites is what he's saying, right? Everything they do is for show. Then he uses a line we've heard before. He likes this one. The greatest among you must be your servant, but those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Sound familiar? Then he just rips into them. What sorrow or woe to you, right? So what sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites? You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You won't go in yourself, and you don't let others in either. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, you Pharisees, hypocrites? For you cross land and sea to make one convert, and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell. You yourselves are. Blind guy. Yeah, oh. Blind guides, what sorrow awaits you? He doesn't stop. He keeps going, going, going. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites? You are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, for example, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. Blind guides, hard to understand. You strain your water so you don't accidentally swallow a gnat, <clears throat> but... <laughs> then you swallow a camel. Again, you're in all these little tiny details, but you're missing the big things. So a lot of hyperbole there. He's getting their attention. What Again, what sorrow? Woe to you, teachers of religious law and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're filthy. What sorrow? Woe to you, teachers of religious law and Pharisees, hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs. The same idea, right? So they don't know the graves they're stepping on. There's death inside you. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you'll build tombs for the prophets your ancestors killed, and you decor yeah, decorate monuments of the godly people your ancestors destroyed. So what does this make you think about? Remember the parables we did, right? So two sections there that we had. It all belongs together. So then there's a section where it's very similar to the triumphal entry where he's grieving over Jerusalem that will be destroyed. Uh, in Mark, you'll get a section. It's a little shorter, much shorter uh, than the woes. It's just like kind of a summary there. Then you get this story. Mark 12, 14. Remember, it doesn't stop. You've got to keep reading. Mark 12, 41. Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts. Then a poor widow came and dropped two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. Our section today begins with the tenant farmers. The point, right, the rejection of the prophets and Jesus and the consequences. But notice, they are made to be tenants. So the parable is told under the premise that they're just tenants. Right? So what do they do? They try to get the ownership. They're just tenants. That's what you should have in your mind there. They're just renting space 
from what belongs to someone else. God. Jesus points to the kingdom. Then he reminds them their money belongs to Caesar, right? someone else, followed by teaching about the resurrection. <laughs> Jesus tells them that in heaven, it won't be like here. So in those two answers, we're taught <laughs> that we can't take our money or our wives with us. Now, no jokes, no jokes, no jokes. <laughs> it won't be like that. You won't be married in heaven. <laughs> right? No, no, not us, not us. <laughs> it's somebody else. So anyway, but you can't take it with you. You're getting a theme here, right? You can't take it with you. It's like the ten part. It does not belong to us. Even if we try to take ownership of something or we think it's ours, it's not. Then we continue. The greatest command, love. God, love your neighbor more than everything you want to take with you, right? Then a set of stern warnings for those who love praise of people or wealth more than God. A tear. Our section ends with a woman who gives everything to God. Everything. So it seems like she gets a concept that these tenant farmers or religious leaders do not get. You see the antithesis at the bookend. It all belongs to God. We're just renting or borrowing everything we think we own. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> we sighed. You, you know me, man. I can't help it. it, was, it we saw a couple of weeks ago. Money can have an effect on our ability to change. And then in that message, there's the parable about the guy with the barns. What's the point, right, to kind of maybe modernize it or whatever. But here we have a situation where you have this man. With, and, and the whole thing is in response. A guy comes up to him and basically asks him to like, settle like a legal dispute with his brother over his father's estate, right? So Jesus just goes, you're missing the point, like Jesus always does. Like, ah, beware, right? You have every kind of greed, he tells me. He tells his story. There was a man that had these barns. Great harvest. He got all these crops. He had all this stuff. And so he fills up his barns. His barns are full. So this is implied. It's not said by Jesus. But think, like, the man says, well, what am I going to do? I've run out of rooms in my barns, right? And so you're thinking, or hopefully you're thinking, like, well, maybe you could give some to the poor, help your church, like something like that, Right? But he says, I know what I'll do. I'll build even bigger barns. Then I'll be all set. Ah, we can relax now. We're good. Everything's fine. Then God comes into the story and says, you fool. You'll die tonight. Now who's going to get everything you worked for? Doesn't belong to you anyway. All right, you're just renting it. So today we get some more perspective on that. We can't take it with us. It doesn't belong to us anyway. The Pharisees don't get that, but the woman knew. So he's good, bad example, right? And good example. You cannot take it with you. So <laughs> I talk to you guys a lot about different jobs I've had, right? So try to relate to different things and bring things into, uh, <laughs> into the sermons. And I thought about this one job. I couldn't help it. It came to mind that I had for a little while. And it, it reminded me of the theme. It kind of reminded me of the guy with the U-Haul truck, the story. And uh, it was like an estate clearing job, uh, kind of interesting. Like, so say someone dies um, and they own a lot of stuff, <laughs> they think, and then they just don't have anyone to leave it to or something like that, right? So we go in, we clear it out, and then smarter people than me at the time would like sell it and auction it off or whatever it was, right? And so you go through the house and it kind of like, it was really sobering and I was young. I, I, I'm, probably late teens or something like that. I was pretty young, and it was heavy, right? It was really like, whoa, you know, this is kind of crazy because you're going through all this person's stuff, right? Even their private stuff, stuff they think they owned, you know, they, they, they kept it nice, they hid it, you know, all these things, and you're like, man, you know, did this guy know that this teenage, like, dirtbag is going through his house, like, rifling through all his stuff, you know? Like, it probably wasn't in this person's mind when they put it in the safe or they hid it there or they did the, you know, so you go through everything. And so it was very sobering. It was kind of interesting. It was like the guy in the story, you know, he got all put in a truck, you know, and then <laughs> hauled off somewhere, but not behind him to his grave, you know, not there. It was just, just kind of like wrapped my mind around it. It really kind of 
blew my mind. And there was stuff, and I, you might have been thinking this, I was when I got the job, like, what can I take? <laughs> what do I get? And so that was like a perk of the job. And I was told that one. Sometimes you get to keep stuff, right? And one of the things that they just didn't often take were books. They didn't take books. Because generally, you know, everyone has like a book. They're like, this is worth $500,000. It's not. It's not worth a lot of money. Like, there are very few books that are worth like a whole lot of money. And if you're my wife, she worked at a bookstore. We've been involved in publishing industry, and I have a lot of books in my house now, a lot of Bibles. Books are heavy. Anyone who's worked around books will know they're really, really, really heavy. Taking all this paper and pressing it down into this thing. And so they weigh a lot. And so they don't want to deal with it, right? So they just, they won't make weight on the U-Haul, right? So they're, they're, they don't want to deal with it. And so you get to keep books if you're interested in them. Well, so I went through this pile of books. And then I found that. It's heavy, right? So you get a workout. So big dictionary, right? And it interested me because it's not like books today. It had all these like, you know, embossment or engravings and stuff. I was like, that looks cool. And it would make me look smart if I put it in my room. So <laughs> that was probably what I was thinking. So, you know, I got it home. It was really interesting. And I opened it up, right? I actually read it. <laughs> That's the whole thing. I opened it up. And, uh, and then I saw this. This was there. And everything stopped. Why? I was thinking. Well, I kind of knew what it is. Boutonniere? Is that the word for it? She corrected me. I was like, corsage? What are they called? Right? So this is something that, you know, if you've been tortured like I was and wore suits as a kid, they had these things pinned on for special occasions, right? So you get this pinned on. So I couldn't help, or my mind couldn't help, they're like squirrels or birds or something. <laughs> Pictures and everything. So, but here's the thing. So about the dictionary. This is about, I think it's 1956. So at the time, I don't even want to say, uh, you know, maybe it was like 40 years old or something like that. Now it's like 70 years old. At the time, when you're a kid, like 40 years, oh, you know, it means I'm going to die, right? So 40 years is really, really old. And so that's a long time ago. And so I'm thinking, like, this is ancient. This is a long time ago, the person has died, and your mind races, right? So you're like, okay, you know, and we were doing this when I brought it out. I brought it out. It's been on a shelf for like 10 years, and I brought it out, and they're like, why is that there? You know, what's it going to do with it? So Heather and I were talking about it, and they're like, what do you think it was? So, you know, I don't know why. My mind went to like a teenage girl, like prom. I started thinking about like prom, like, you know, something like that, right? And so you have this situation where if you're thinking about the thing in its entirety, so this girl, and at that point, right, you're a teenager, you don't know anything else. Maybe it's a prom, maybe it's your first date, maybe it's your first kiss, something like that. And it's like really special, right? So she's like, oh my gosh, I'm going to remember this forever. She didn't. So, <laughs> you know, remember this forever, you know, and I'm going to put it in there. This is going to last forever. This is beautiful. This is, a, you know, maybe the boys are in love. We're going to get married. Everything's going to be great. It's like this huge special thing and something that she's trying to keep and preserve. Forever. Or Heather brought up the point. You, you made it uh, a father of the bride. You know, my daughter got married, and he, maybe he remembers <laughs> getting that pinned on. The daddy-daughter dance. You know, and he, 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 wants, he cherishes that moment. And so he puts it in here. What is it? I don't know, but it was really important to this person. And this whole thing stuck with me so deeply that I don't even know, like 40 years, 30 years later, 30 years later, I'm not that old yet, 30 years later, it, it, it came to my mind as soon as I was preparing the message. And the book has been up on a shelf in my house for 10 years. I haven't touched it. And it's just an amazing thing to think about. This thing that someone took so much time to carefully preserve was so important to them ends up in my house on a shelf. No one knows about it. And the story is still nameless, faceless story. We don't know. She couldn't take it with her. It should make you think. Now, when I think about the estate clearing thing, <laughs> there are going to be several disclaimers here. 
Disclaimer, that's what it says in my notes, careful. <laughs> when I think about the estate clearing thing, I think about a term that we use, home ownership. Now, when I, because of my experiences in life, when someone says, like, they get a mortgage, and it's like, congratulations, home, I have to, like, try not to be like Jesus in this instance and be like the party pooper, right? Because people are always doing that. They go, there's a feast, right? And everybody gets there, and Jesus is always pointing out things doing wrong, like somebody's doing something wrong, right? Someone sits at the head of the table. He's like, those who humble themselves will be exalted. And so I try not, <laughs> you know, right? I try not to do that. He's always doing that. Like, read the Bible, and, like, it's okay to laugh sometimes because he is, like, the worst party guest, right? He's going to ruin your party. So anyway, I try not to ruin this person's party because they're really happy and they're like, come on, shit. You know, and I'm like, you don't know what a pain in the neck, insert a different word, that is going to be for you, right? <laughs> That's what comes through my mind. Because you just got a mortgage. Okay, now those of you who have been through a foreclosure process, <laughs> you know that home ain't yours. The minute you don't pay, <laughs> right, like the 10 farm, it's gone. They're taking that home that you think you own from you. It doesn't matter whether you're 20 years in, you've got $100,000 invested, it's not yours and neither is any of that money. It's gone. Now, this is the disclaimer. I am not a financial advisor, <laughs> right? Like I'm not a doctor, I give the medical thing. I just have experience. And so I've been on both sides. I've had a home taken from me. I, I own a home, you know, so I get all in. So I'm not saying that home ownership is a bad thing. Are you hearing me? I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Okay? It can be a good investment if you do it right, and I'm not giving any more financial advice because we shouldn't be thinking like that. When people do that, like, stop it. Like, what does Jesus do about the money? You know what I mean? I don't want to talk about the money. Right? So if we find Christian, like, you know, speakers talking too much about money and not all about Jesus, it's called a false teacher. Hypocrite! <laughs> That's what Jesus is saying to them. People care so much about money. Anyway, it can be a good financial move, Right? Depending on the situation, that's fine. There's just nothing wrong with that. But being a homeowner, it's still an illusion. Even if you got rid of the mortgage, what happens when they want to build a road through where your house is? It's not yours. What happens when you don't pay your taxes or right? something like that, depending on where you live? It's not yours. Find that out real quick. Natural disaster. What happens? That's it. So it made me think of something, and it's kind of funny. I just have a ton of jokes here, but I'll keep it short. <laughs> it, it just, I don't know how many times I've said it, owning a home, like, man, like, it's kind of nice to just rent. <laughs> you know, so that happens when the AC unit breaks, right? <laughs> you know, you're like, ah. Remember when we were renting? It was so easy because that's the landlord's problem. That's the landlord's problem. That's the landlord's problem. It was so nice. Because it just seems like every now and then your hit was like a grand, you know, or like whatever it is. You're like, no, I was trying to save for a TV. You know, and every time you try to save for a big TV, then the refrigerator goes. You're something like that. But renting, again, home ownership, yes, good. Renting was freeing. There was just a part of it that was really freeing. It's kind of nice. Not to worry about that stuff all the time, you know? Because you hear the noises, right? Or like, we had a house in New York, <laughs> nightmare house, contemporary house, three stories up. Oh, it's so cool, contemporary house with a flat roof. Don't ever get a house with a flat roof. <laughs> a church has a flat roof, right? Leaks. Like, I had nightmares about leaks. Like, everything leaked. And so even to this day at the house I'm in, it has like a shingled roof, small house, not a problem. Like, I hear any water drips, I'm like... Like, I'll wake up out of bed. It's like I get scared. I get nightmares about leaks, right? But we didn't have those nightmares when we were renting. It's the landlord's problem, right? Like, if it drips on the carpet, I'm like, I don't know, new carpet, right? <laughs> Who cares? You're not worried about it. It was freeing, actually. Renting can be freeing. And here's the thing. We don't own it anyway. That's what God tells us. We don't own it anyway. We're just tenants here. And so when we get to 1 Peter, he's writing to the church. They're experiencing suffering. We've looked at it recently, right, in the context of people groups, like wives, treat your husband this way, husbands, wives, all those things. And in the midst of it, he says something quite interesting. 1 Peter 2, 11. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. 
could say sojourners or aliens, right? Someone passing, it's probably what he's thinking of, right? The Israelites wandering around for 40 years, right? You're just, you're just passing through. Temporary residents, foreigners, strangers, passing through. This, what, this is not our home. This is not our home. This isn't our stuff. Peter goes on to describe his body, as if you read 2 Peter, as an earthly tent. That is something that is constructed temporarily and then taken down. It's not permanent. Nothing is. So he starts off, dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you're really among those God has called and chosen. Do these things and you'll never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What? You temporarily, then when you get to your destination, your home, then you'll get the grand entrance into your real home. 2 Peter 1.12, therefore, I will always remind you about these things, even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth you have been taught. And it is only right that I should keep on reminding you as long as I live, the Greek says, as long as I am in this tent or tabernacle. For our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me that I must soon leave this earthly life. They're translating it that way because he's saying, I must soon put off my tent, which just sounds weird, your tabernacle. So they're, they're trying to explain to you what he's saying. So that's what it says in the Greek. I must soon put off my tent. That's it. So I'll work hard to make sure you always remember these things after I am gone. They have these things in mind all the time. Paul says a similar thing. 2 Corinthians 5.1. For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies and we long to, long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. For we will put on heavenly bodies, we will not be spirits without bodies. While we live in these earthly bodies, while... We groan and sigh, but it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. God himself has prepared us for this. And as a guarantee, he has given us his Holy Spirit. So we're always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord. For we live by believing, not by seeing. We live by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are fully confident and would rather be away from these bodies for then we'll be at home with the Lord. Not usually the verse of the day, but it's crystal clear. That's the goal. We are not at home with the Lord, truly, until we pack up this tent and we go home to be with him. That's what God, God's word says, right? He is our true home. While we're in these tents, we're not truly at home. We're simply renting space, right? We're simply passing through. Everything is borrowed from God. and Nothing really belongs to us. Yet knowing all of this, we can sometimes enslave ourselves to worldly things. The homes that we think we own can end up owning us. They can become prisons, in a sense. And we do this with other, like, borrowed possessions as well. This is why Jesus teaches this way. We'll go back to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 19. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Where your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. 
Remember the context of all the worries. People are like, Jesus says, don't worry about anything. What's the context? It's always stuff. That's his response when they worry about, don't worry about your food or clothing or what to eat, right? The context about not worrying is about your stuff. Don't worry about that. But you see, having all this stuff can make us worry. It can be the root of all the anxiety that we're having. It's about not being enslaved to your stuff. Now, how do we get there? It's tough. We live in this commercialized world. Everything, even church is commercialized. It's disgusting. Don't worry, I won't get started on that again. But it is. And if it isn't, it's not good. And so what do we do? We're always being sold something, sold something, sold something, sold it. It's crazy. What do we do? And here's another disclaimer. It's okay to have some nice things. Check it. Make sure it doesn't own you. It's okay. I used to have a lot of nice things. And I got rid of more than I kept. And I'm better off for it. It's freeing. So, an exercise. What can we do? Think about the things you have. And evaluate how much joy they're actually causing you versus how much stress they're causing you. Do you find yourself occupied with this stuff, with these things? How much joy is that bringing? Right? Maybe get a suitcase <laughs> and put all your favorite stuff in there. Right? Take it around with you everywhere you go. You know, like show and tell everywhere. <laughs> Travel abroad, right? And then come back and start looking at all the stuff you didn't take with you. Did you need it? What are you saving it for? How much worry? Perhaps your closet. Maybe you have a closet that's overflowing like the man with the barns. <laughs> How much of it do you need? You know, I start looking at like my shirts in my closet. Like, so there's a lot of them in there and I'm like, when's the last time I wore that one? You know, maybe give it away. Get rid of it. Taking up too much space. Again, maybe it's something causing you, <laughs> we're going through this now. Again, it's funny, I just laugh. Because I, I used to have a lot of cars. I've had a lot of cars and I had like a really nice Italian sports car. And um, it was funny because when I moved into ministry, I was like, eh, now I'm not as worried about it. I don't really don't care what any of you think. But in the beginning, <laughs> you get to that point, I just don't care. <laughs> like, but in the beginning, I was like, is this appropriate for like, you know, a person in ministry to have? I don't know. Again, I don't care. Like my wife works. I'm like, whatever. We have nice cars. But I was worried about it, right? So, and also, we went through a period where I was out of the business and we didn't have any money. So we started selling stuff to live, right, to get by. And I couldn't keep things, certain things anyway, because on a car like that, when your clutch goes, it's $12,000. So I was like, all right, we're not going to do this anymore. So <clears throat> I sold it. <laughs> I got to tell you, it was one of those cars, you know, you have a, a teenage boy a poster on the wall. It was so freeing. <laughs> it was so freeing. Because even I'd park it places, like, it's not like down here where there's like, you're going to leave church today and see that car, right? But... You know, in New York, they're like, are you lost? You know, <laughs> like, what? it was in a neighborhood like that. You know, and what would happen? I'd park it. People would sit on it and scratch it and all this other stuff. I'm like, ugh. They would just worry about it. I'd worry about it, right? Like, the winds would blow too hard. I'm like, oh, something on the garage fall on it. I'm like, thinking about it all the time. And then all of a sudden, i got to replace something. And what a headache. I've heard, like, owning a boat is like that. You know, so <laughs> never own one of those. But what a headache. And now we're reminded of it again. We had a pretty nice car, but, you know, it's like we had to do a repair. And I was like, oh, my gosh, really? And now we're talking about getting rid of it for something utilitarian. And I'm like, oh, we're growing up. <laughs> it's amazing, right? Let's just get something practical. I'm like, oh, how old are we? You know, like, that's crazy. But we're having those conversations. Right? It took a long time for us to get smart and figure this out. It's kind of cool. I like the noise it makes. But uh, is it worth it? Don't know. Heather's like, yeah, it's gonna be interesting breaking up with my car, you know. I'm like, but it's a bad relationship. <laughs> it's expensive. So that's the advice, that's the application today. You know, just just to encourage you, everything in this world, everything in this world will break. It will let us down. It will cause us stress, stress, and ag stress, sorry, <laughs> and aggravation but not Jesus. That's the focus. That's the thing. That's the key to our joy. Focus on him.
<laughs> our worldly desires will produce more. More stress, <laughs> more worry, more anxiety, anger, jealousy, envy, greed. All that stuff is good at that, antagonizing that part of us, the flesh. But, Galatians 5, flesh is at war with the spirit. The spirit produces love, joy, peace. Remember what Paul is telling Timothy? But contentment itself is gain, is wealth. Contentment itself is wealth. So that's an invitation. We talked about being baptized. If you want to know about that, if you're in a place where it's like a hamster wheel, and I was there, I've been there. Ugh, there's never enough. Pulling out off the car lot, looking at the next, back at the next car while I'm in my new car. It's ridiculous. It never ends. No, you're not going to can tell you this. You're not going to get to a goal where it's just like, bam, that's going to be enough. If you're in that type of disease, if you're on that hamster wheel, it's never enough. It's never going to be enough. So if your barns are full, but you're not fulfilled, if you're in that space, don't build the bigger barns. Come talk to me. You'll be told how you can do that. If you're tired of setting goals and not really getting anywhere, let me tell you about Jesus, where you can find that fulfillment in him, the love the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the self-control in any circumstance. Let's talk about him. Amen? Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for everyone in the hearing of my voice, sound of my voice. I just pray today that you would touch hearts. You cause people to surrender to you, Lord, where they can find that love, that joy, that peace, that patience, that kindness and goodness. And then be inspired to share that with others as vehicles of your gospel message. Lord, I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.